Hello, America. Mark Levin, and this is Life, Liberty, and Levin, the first show of the new year. Thanks for being here. It's quite a week, wasn't it? Well, I hate to tell you this. There's going to be many more like it with such a close vote, such a close number in the House of Representatives. And I watched it, as many of you did. And one of the people who spoke most eloquently, I thought, that really drew my attention was Congressman Brian Mast of Florida. Because his words kind of echoed what Benjamin Franklin had said. And what Mass said, and I paraphrase, is we can pass all the rules we want. If we in this body, the majority, the Republicans, don't do the right thing, the rules don't matter. I said, this man is on to something. All the talk about all the rules, following the rules. If we don't have virtuous members of the House, the rules don't matter. And so I got to thinking of Benjamin Franklin's comments, his final comments on September 17, 1787, the last day of the Constitutional Convention. He was in his 80s. He was very ill. He had terrible gout. He was going to stand up and give his speech, but he couldn't stand up. So he handed it to his friend and another delegate from Pennsylvania, James Wilson, who read it. And I want you to listen to this. This is what Benjamin Franklin said. I confess that I do not entirely approve of this Constitution at present, but, sir, I am not sure I shall never approve it, for having lived long, I have experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration to change opinions even on important subjects, which I once thought right but found to be otherwise. It is therefore that the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. Most men indeed, as well as most sects in religion, think themselves in possession of all truth and that whatever others differ from them, it is so far error. Skipping. In these sentiments, sir, I agree to this Constitution with all its faults, if they are such, because I think a general government necessary for us, and there is no form of government but what may be a blessing to the people if well administered. If well administered. And I believe farther that this is likely to be well administered for a course of years and can only end in despotism as other forms have done before it when the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. I doubt, too, whether any other convention we can obtain may be able to make a better constitution. For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. From such an assembly can a perfect production be expected? It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does, and I think it will astonish our enemies, who are waiting with confidence to hear that our councils are confounded, like those of the builders of Babel, and that our states are on the point of separation, only to meet hereafter for the purpose of cutting one another's throats. Thus I consent, sir, to this Constitution, because I expect no better and because I am not sure that it is not the best. The opinions I have had of its errors I sacrifice to the public good. I have never whispered a syllable of them abroad. Within these walls they were born, and here they shall die. If every one of us, in returning to our constituents, were to report the objections he has had to it, and endeavor to gain partisans in support of them, we might prevent it being generally received and thereby lose all the salutary effects and great advantages resulting naturally in our favor among foreign nations, as well as among ourselves, from our real or apparent unanimity. Much of the strength and efficiency of any government in procuring and securing happiness to the people depends on opinion, on the general opinion of the goodness of the government, as well as of the wisdom and integrity of its governors. I hope, therefore, that for our own sakes, as a part of the people, and for the sakes of our posterity, we shall act heartily and unanimously in recommending this Constitution, 
wherever our influence may extend, and turn our future thoughts and endeavors to the means of having it well administered. On the whole, sir, I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have objection to it would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his own infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity put his name to this instrument. Well, they almost all did. 39 did and three did not. Three who I respect greatly, including George Mason. Why did Mason vote against the Constitution? Because he believed there should be a Bill of Rights. And later on, they did, in fact, add a Bill of Rights. So the battle was being waged after this convention adopted the Constitution. And it started with the Anti-Federalists. Do you know who the Anti-Federalists were? The people who opposed the Constitution? Well, they wrote what was called today the Anti-Federalist Papers, 85 essays, just like the Federalist Papers turned out to be 85 essays. And they were wrote un uh, uh, written under pseudonyms, Cato and Brutus. Cato was thought to be the New York governor, George Clinton, and Brutus was Justice Robert Gates, and another gentleman as well, uh, by the name of Smith. And they wrote very well, and they raised incredible objections. So then the supporters of the Constitution, well, Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay, John Jay wrote three of the 85, he would get sick, so he stopped writing, but Madison and Hamilton carried most of the water. John Jay would become the first Chief Justice of the United States down the road. And so they duked it out. And so uh, what happened? Well, as you know, the Constitution was ratified, but it wasn't easy. New York, Massachusetts, and Virginia, three of the most important states, it was in doubt whether the Constitution would pass. And then certain great men stood up and defended it against other great men, but they stood up and they defended it. On February 6, 1788, in Massachusetts, it was ratified. You want another vote? 187 to 168. It was that close. In New Hampshire, it was ratified. The vote was 57 to 47. It was that close. In, on June 25, 1788, shortly after New Hampshire voted, Virginia ratified 89 to 79. It was that close because two of the great leaders opposing the Constitution were Patrick Henry and George Mason. But then again, they were up against people like Madison and so forth. In New York, it was ratified 30 to 27. So the Constitution we have today almost was not ratified. Now... Those who lost the vote didn't go around and try and destroy the Constitution, and they didn't go around and try and destroy the men who supported the Constitution. They decided to do exactly what Benjamin Franklin said, administer, and administer as well as they could. George Mason's objection to a Bill of Rights, well, guess what? That had a lot of support in the states, in the ratifying conventions, the legislatures. And so they came up with 17 amendments in the House of Representatives, sent them to the Senate. They whittled it down to 12. 12 amendments, proposed amendments, were sent to the states for ratification, and 10 were adopted. Your Bill of Rights, which would be added to the Constitution of the United States. These men wanted to govern. They wanted liberty. These men wanted to protect their country from foreign enemies. These men wanted commerce to work because they had a problem with it under the Articles of Confederation. For the most part, these were virtuous people. Do we have virtuous people today? Who are our great leaders in Congress today? Who are our great members of the House of Representatives in Congress today? Well, there are many. We have six people who voted present the other day, despite the fact that I think all the rules that they wanted, into the weeds and into the details they got, but they told us. They didn't want McCarthy to be Speaker of the House. That's perfectly fine. But the problem is you had an extremely close vote. And if it wasn't McCarthy, it wasn't going to be anybody else. How do I know? Because like you, I watched it for four days and 15 votes. There was nobody else. Nobody else would stand up, and anybody who would couldn't get the votes. Meanwhile, the enemy of this republic, 
the Biden administration, the Democrats, our Stasi, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, they're chugging along. They keep moving along. And this is what was infuriating me about this. Now we got the rules that we wanted, right? Now what are they gonna do with these rules? What are they gonna do with the border? What are they gonna do about all these things that you and I care about, that Mr. and Mrs. America care about? Guess what, two, three weeks from now, you're not gonna care about the rules, you're not gonna know about the rules, whether one was 72 hours or germaneness or anything else. You're gonna to wanna to do the same things. What are we gonna do about energy and this climate change Marxism? What are we gonna to do to secure the border? Because I wanna read you one other thing from Barry Goldwater. He wrote a book in 1970, 52 years ago, called The Conscience of a Majority. And in port, here, here is what Barry Goldwater said in part. The future could be as frightening as it is hopeful, as terror-ridden as it is exciting, as positive as it is negative. It all depends upon our attitude and our commitment and our dedication as we embark and move along toward the challenges of tomorrow, which are also the challenges of today. The maintenance of individual freedom is the common denominator. It has always been man's greatest challenge and will forever fall in that category. If we base our efforts on the past, if we use the past, if we treat what has gone before merely as prologue, as something that we learned for the primary purpose of making us equal to the tasks that lie ahead, we will proceed firmly and surely. Probably the major reason why I've attempted to write this book is to add to the library of conservative publications is that the utter and complete failure of so-called liberalism makes it again necessary for the people of this country to do some real thinking and searching for a philosophy and an application of that philosophy, which in their opinion will solve the problems of today and prevent the problems of tomorrow. The gigantic size, this is 50 years ago, and influence of the federal government, against which conservatives have been warning for many years, has now grown almost completely out of hand. And he gives a long list, he articulates a long list of the problems. They are the same problems we face today, more than half a century later. So while people are cheering for one side or another, one ideology or another, it's a lot more complicated than that, folks. And I just want to warn the Republicans in the House. If your majority deteriorates into personal attacks, into getting nowhere, into getting into the weeds about this rule or that rule or another rule, while 10,000 illegal aliens are crossing our border, while fentanyl's killing 10,000 of our young people every month, while the FBI is trying to chase down people who believe in, in life and are op and opposed to abortion and threatening parents, and while the Department of Justice is trying to indict a former president of the United States, and while they're destroying our economic system and they're destroying our constitutional system, you can all declare victory from what took place last week. God bless you. But if you don't unite to fight tyranny, then the people will rise up against you. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.